Welcome to Marine Gurukul video series. We are pleased to present this video on dynamic stresses that are experienced by the ship's hull. Dynamic because these stresses keep changing as the sea waves go past the ship's hull. So the dynamic stresses are the stresses induced because of the relative motion of the sea waves with respect to the ship's hull. We hope that before you continue with this video, you have watched and understood the earlier video titled Static Stresses. If not, it is suggested that you watch the same before proceeding ahead with this one. The dynamic stresses which are, as already said, induced because of the relative motion between the ship and the sea waves include hogging, sagging, Penting stresses, pounding stresses, raking stresses, torsional stresses, vibrational stresses, and sloshing of the liquid in the tank. So, it stresses induced because of the liquid sloshing in the tanks. Dynamic hogging. We have already studied about the longitudinal deformation of the vessel. When the vessel is stationary in calm or static seas, under the static stresses leading to a situation wherein the vessel may hog or sag. However, if this hog or sag, the longitudinal bending, is induced by the wave motion going past the vessel, then these stresses, the hog or sag, would be referred to as dynamic hogging or dynamic sagging. In case of dynamic hogging, let's visualize a case wherein we have the crest of the wave as it passes located at or near the amidship region and the trough at the ends. We have here the ship with its static water line being here. Now as the wave passes, so if there is any deformation, longitudinal deformation in this condition, that will be under the static stresses. But now let's have the wave passing it so that we have Est at or near the midship. So, this is the dynamic water line because it will keep changing as the waves go past the ship's hull. Now, what does this result into? This results into greater part underwater volume in the midship region compared to the static water line. That means increased buoyancy in the midship region and with respect to the static water line, reduced buoyancy at the ends. So what does this result into then? When we have additional buoyancy here because of the crest, the resultant force here becomes upwards and at the ends it becomes downward. So we have a resultant downward force at the ends and a resultant upward force amidships or in the midship region. And this is caused because of the varying buoyancy along the length of the vessel caused because of the wave motion location of the crest and the trough and now we know that when the resultant forces are in this manner then if we have the vessels represented as a beam with the resultant downward forces at the ends and resultant upward force amidships this will cause the vessel to bend so that the midship region bends upwards causing the vessel to hog and we know this is how the vessel would hog. Now, when the vessel hogs, as we have already learned in the static stresses, the deck and upper regions, or the deck and the upper regions, would be under tensile stress or under tension, and the lower parts and the keel region would be under compressive stress or under compression. During the longitudinal bending, there will be one axis along which there will be no stress because of the bending and that axis we know is the neutral axis. Neutral axis is the only axis where there will be no stress and this longitudinal bending induced by the wave motion is termed as dynamic hogging. Dynamic sagging, having understood dynamic hogging Dynamic sagging should not take much of our time. If we interchange the location of the crest and the trough, that means that if the crest 
happen to be near at or near the ends and the trough at or near the midship. So we have the static water line of the vessel. We have the dynamic water line of the vessel. What we see is that in the middle part or in the midship region, the buoyancy gets reduced. Obviously, then this will cause a resultant downward force in the midship region and a resultant upward force at or near the ends because of the increased buoyancy. And when we represent the same thing on the beam, we know that this will result into a condition which will cause the vessel to sag with the midship draft increasing or the mid midship region bending downwards. And again, in this case, we know that the deck and the upper parts would be under now compressive stresses or under compression and keel and the lower portions would be under tensile stress or under tension. Neutral axis would have no tension, no stress because of this bending. Again, please note whether it is dynamic bending, longitudinal bending or static bending. The uh, stresses because of the longitudinal deformation which are zero at the neutral axis their value keeps increasing as we keep going away from the neutral axis so in the upper part the decks deck would experience the maximum stress and in the lower part the keel would experience the maximum stress so as we keep going away from the neutral axis the stress because of the longitudinal bending will keep increasing. Penting stresses. Under the static stresses, we had learned that the water pressure at any point on the hull depends on the depth of that particular point below the water surface. Now, when the vessel encounters waves, the bow experiences the passage of the crest and the trough alternately. So it encounters the crest and trough alternately. This alternating passage of the crest and the trough causes the pressure on the immersed hull to alternately increase and decrease. Let us see this diagram here where we have the side view or the profile view of the ship's bow with the static water line being shown here. Now, at any point, let's consider the ship's hull at any point below the static water line. And let us say this is the hull because of the stresses imposed by the water pressure in the static condition. Now, if now the bow encounters a crest, then the draft you can see here, when the crest passes the bow, the draft here increases thus increasing the depth of the point where this hull is being considered in the lower diagram and therefore the water pressure on this hull plating increases inwards which is being shown by these green arrows here and they tend to deform the vessel plating inwards with respect to which one what condition the plating with respect to the plating as it was in the static condition right and this may cause the plating to deform inwards as shown by the green broken line. Now, crest is not going to be there permanently. Crest goes past the bow and now the trough reaches the bow. When the trough reaches the bow, you can see with this red water line, the draft is decreased. When the draft is decreased now, the water pressure on this hull also reduces so basically the reduced water pressure will basically as if the hull plating is being pushed outwards and it will tend to deform to this red broken line now the full lines show the plating condition in the static condition and then we see that as the crest and the trough alternately pass that will tend to cause the plating to move in and out alternately. So this alternating water pressure on the hull plating causes an in and out motion of the plating. And this is as if 
the lungs of a person who's done heavy exercise and is panting for breath the lungs expand contract expand contract so the plating tends to behave like a bellow or the lungs and therefore this in and out movement of the hull plating caused because of the varying water pressure is called as panting and like any other deformation this will also tend to set in some stresses and the stresses are called as the panting stresses the panting effect is most pronounced at the bows and especially when the vessel is making a headway pounding stresses now when, when a vessel experiences head seas or nearly head seas that means waves are coming from right ahead the bow may encounter the crest and when the bow encounters the crest the bow will ride the crest the if the bow is riding the crest obviously the truck would be somewhere in the after part where would it exactly be located would depend on the wavelength and the length of the ship let us consider this first condition in the diagram a which has come up on the screen wherein the bow is riding the crest and the trough is somewhere near the after part of the vessel now the wave passes relative to the ship the crest passes to the after part or near the stern and now the bow encounters the trough as shown in this diagram b in diagram b we have the crest passing to the after uh, sorry we have the crest passing to the after part and the bow encounters the trough now in rough seas when the vessel encounters these waves very often during the pitching of the ship the bow gets lifted clear of the water as you can see in this diagram now with the bow having been lifted clear of the water the weight of the forward part is acting downwards increased buoyancy in the after part is also acting upwards from the after region now vessel is clear of the water the, or rather the bow is lifted clear of the water the weight of the bow and the increased buoyancy from the after part all getting together and may often cause the bow to slam or hit the water surface so the bow may slam the water surface or pounds on the water surface the slamming of the bow on the water surface is called as pounding and obviously the region which is most susceptible to pounding is the forward part and the forward part experiences the stresses which are induced because of the bow slamming or the bow pounding and these stresses are called as pounding stresses raking stresses when a ship rolls it rolls about an imaginary axis which runs in the fore and aft direction through the ship's center of gravity this axis about which the vessel rolls is referred to its axis of roll now here is the ship in the upright condition with the ship's static water line and the center line coming up in the diagram and if the center of gravity of the ship happens to be here then a fore and aft axis through the center of gravity which will appear as a dot only in the cross sectional view represents the vessel's axis of roll now as the ship rolls we know the deck and the upper part of the hull will move in one direction and the keel together with the hull components below the axis of the roll move in the opposite direction that means if the ship rolls to port side the deck and the upper components of the hull will move to port side and the keel together with the low com hull components in the lower part will move to the starboard side now we can see here the wave hitting the ship and the ship the rolled or inclined condition being shown in this blue color out here the center line in the he, uh, rolled condition or the heeled condition or the inclined condition is also shown up now on board we know 
that the amplitude of the roll is expressed in angular measure in degrees. We say the ship has rolled 2 degrees, 5 degrees or 10 degrees. But the different hull components experience different amount of linear displacement for the same angle of roll. You can see in this diagram that at the level of the axis of the roll, the center line of the ship in the upright condition and the center line in the inclined condition are meeting. But as we go away from this axis of roll, they keep opening up. That means the hull components which are located far off from the axis of roll experience a greater uh, linear displacement compared to the hull components which are closer to the axis of the roll for the same angle of roll that the vessel may have experienced. Now, as the vessel rolls from side to side, the hull structure experiences accelerating forces. Why? Because when the vessel reaches one extremity of the roll, it is at rest. Then it starts moving, it will pick up speed, gain speed, and then the speed has to reduce, and then it becomes zero again at the other extremity of the roll. So while it rolls from one extremity to the other, the vessel experiences accelerating forces. The deck and the keel being farthest from the axis of the roll will obviously experience maximum accelerating forces. Why? Because they experience the maximum transverse displacement as already discussed that the points closer to the axis of roll have lesser transverse displacement compared to the points on the hull which are farther away from the axis of roll. This causes these accelerating forces and these also varying from varying with the distance from the axis of roll cause the deck to move sideways relative to the bottom structure. As you can see with this, these broken lines coming up in the diagram. So the deck has tends to move slightly sideways with respect to the bottom structure because of the accelerate the accelerating forces being maximum at the deck level and at the keel level and being in opposite direction because if deck moves to one side the keel moves to the other side so the accelerating side uh, accelerating forces are also acting in the opposite directions so this will cause a tendency for the deck to move sideways that is literally relative to the bottom structure such deformation is called as raking and the stress thus induced as the ship rolls from one side to another are called as raking stresses torsional stresses we know that when the vessel encounters head seas or nearly head seas they'll primarily set in pitching motion and pitching induces pounding stresses Contrary to this, if the vessel experiences beam seas or nearly beam seas, they are going to induce rolling motion and rolling will induce the raking stresses. However, when the seas are encountered obliquely, let us say four points on the bows or four points on the quarters, they will induce hybrid motion into the ship. That means both rolling and pitching it will be a combination of rolling and pitching because seas are neither from right ahead nor from beam so obviously now it will have a certain component which will be in the fore and aft direction another component in the athwart ship direction so that's going to induce a hybrid motion let's consider this plan view of the ship with the center line shown let us say she is encountering seas from the starboard bow and there is a crest which is located at the cross section AA on the starboard side. So on the starboard bow at cross section AA and another crest located at cross section BB on the port quarter. So this crest is on the starboard bow and this crest is on the port 
quarter. During such a situation, the ship shall be subject to a twisting moment. And this twisting moment will be caused because of the opposing writing moment at the two ends. So if the bow is experiencing writing moment to port, the stern will experiencing writing moment to starboard. And these two opposing writing moments cause a twisting moment which will tend to twist the vessel. Let's try to understand how these opposing moments are caused. Let's consider the vessel's uh, cross-sectional view at station AA. You can see it coming up on the diagram with these two being the sides, this being the keel here and the deck. And this is the center line at cross-section AA. We can appreciate this because it's closer to the bow. So you'll have a narrow bow with a flare of the bow. Here is the static water line at station A. Now, since we have assumed that there is a crest onto the starboard bow at station AA, so the wave water line would be as shown by the red line with a crest to starboard. And with this condition, we can appreciate that there will be greater buoyancy on the starboard side of the center line compared to the port side. And this variance in buoyancy would cause a torque to port and this causes a torque to port. That means at cross section AA or in the forward part of the ship, in the assumed condition, the torque is acting to the port. Let's similarly evaluate how is it at station BB or near the stern. Here on the screen is coming the cross section of at station BB. So here is the cross sectional view of station BB near the stern with the center line and the static water line showing up. Now, since we are assuming in this case that there is a crest near the port quarter, so the dynamic or the wave water line as shown by the red line would have the crest onto the port side. We can see that there is greater underwater volume on the port side. So there would be greater force of buoyancy on to the port of the center line compared to starboard leading to a torque which is acting to the starboard side. So at station BB, the vessel experiences a torque to starboard which you can see in this plan view also. What do we see in these assumed conditions with the oblique seas? The forward part experiences talk to port and after part experiences talk to starboard. The twisting moment of these two opposing talks tends to twist the hull and induce stress in the hull called as the torsional stresses. The torsional stress produced are countered well by most ships. Why? Because ship is like a box girder. You make it like a box with the keel, double bottom, sides and the de uh, deck. So it's like a box structure. So they are able to withstand this torsional stresses because of the inherent strength that comes to them because of the box girder construction. However, when ships have huge openings like hatchway openings on deck, then the problem could start and especially with ships like container ships. So there we have to compensate for the loss of strength. And usually there are torsional boxes, which we'll talk about when we talk about construction of ships, which help in countering the torsional stresses. Torsional stresses can also be caused. Here we saw that they were caused because of the varying buoyancy. They could also be caused by asymmetrical loading about the center line at the two ends. But then in that case, such torsional stresses would come under the category of static stresses. But since loading is in the under the control of the ship's team, so loading the torsional stresses because of asymmetrical loading are usually taken care of. And therefore, this torsional stress has only been studied under the dynamic stresses and not under the stra static stresses. But please remember that if we are not careful about the loading, then asymmetrical loading can also lead to 
torsional stresses. Vibrational stresses, we know what vibrations are. These are mechanical oscillations in any object about its point of equilibrium. We also know that every object has something called as its natural frequency of vibration. And what is this? This is the frequency at which it shall vibrate when disturbed from its rest position. That means disturbed and left. So if you just disturb it, leave it, and the frequency at which it will vibrate before it comes back to its equilibrium position and settles, that is called its natural frequency of vibration. If vibrations are forced and forced frequency or the frequency of the forced vibrations reaches the natural frequency of the object, then we also have studied something called as resonance. So the body resonates. Like any other object, vibrations are also caused on board the ships as well. The vibrations on ships can be divided into two types. One is the vibration of the hull or the hull vibrations, which includes the vibration of the main hull, hull structures, and the local structures. So in when we say substructures and local structures, we will see that in a given scenario, you may have greater vibrations being observed in a certain part of the hull compared to the other. Now that is because of the substructures and the local structures. And there is something called as machinery vibrations, which are caused because of the ship's propeller the shafting of the propeller from the main engine, the thrust block, main engine, and other machinery. Obviously, these machineries, these moving parts, as they move, they will also induce vibrations. These hull and machinery vibrations could be a source of excitation to one another, and they could lead to a condition of resonance. So if these shipboard vibrations are not controlled and allowed to reach the condition of resonance, then these vibrations may lead to damage to the hull structure. It could lead to fracture because of the metal fatigue, because the metal is vibrating, it is going to be under fatigue and the fatigue fractures could result. Loosening of the joints, Fluctuation of stresses in the hull and machinery. Why? Because these vibrations will modify the static and dynamic stresses that we have studied until now. It may add to the discomfort of the crew. It may, in the worst case scenario, also lead to failure of some machinery. So, these vibrations need to be controlled. And for that purpose, the ship vibration analysis is carried out and damping mechanisms are incorporated to keep the vibrations within acceptable limits. Sloshing stresses. The sloshing effect refers to the movement of the free surface of a liquid inside the container because of the movement of the container. In our context, what is the container? Container is a tank within the ship. What is the liquid? It is the liquid that is contained in the tank. Now, if the tank happens to be slack, that means it is neither empty. If it's empty, then there is no problem. There's no liquid. If it's 100% full, the compartment is packed and there is no space for the liquid to move. If it's neither empty nor 100% full, then the tank is referred to as slack. So if a tank is slack, then as the ship moves, whether because of rolling or because of pitching, the liquid in the tank also would tend to move and this liquid when it moves from one side to another has a strong interaction with the walls of the tank why because the liquid when it moves from one side to another or from one end to the other it gathers momentum and with that force it goes and hits the boundaries of the tank which tries to restrict the movement of this liquid. So there is a strong interaction between the liquid and the walls of the structure, 
that shall try to restrict the liquid motion. We know the tanks are many on the ship. They are designed to carry water ballast, fresh water, bunker, or even liquid cargo in bulk. And if those tanks happen to be slack, then A, they affect the ship's stability because of what we call its free surface effect, which we shall study under the stability topic. And secondly, they produce impact force on the tank boundaries, which are also part of the ship's hull, and set stresses into them, which become part of the ship stresses and they, these stresses are referred to as sloshing stresses. If these sloshing stresses are not accounted for, not taken care of, strengthening is not done to withstand them, then these sloshing stresses may possibly lead to damage of the tank boundaries also. Now we come to the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching marine gurukul video series hope you like this video find it useful please do reach out to us with your comments and thoughts through youtube channel or you may write to us on marine gurukul at gmail.com thank you once again and all the very best